All right, it's Thursday here on the Morning Pit on YouTube.com slash PantherLair.com. I'm Chris Peak from PantherLair.com. We can anxiously rush through the preliminaries here as long as you're all doing what I ask you to do all the time. Follow the link. Well, type in the link on your, your browser bar, your search bar, Panther-Lair.com for all the latest pit sports coverage, football, basketball, and recruiting. And then like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, YouTube.com slash PantherLair.com. We get a lot of video content there. At PantherLair.com, we have these morning pit videos every day of the week, Monday through Friday. We have our live PantherLair show like we did last night, every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. We do post-game shows as well when there are games, which aren't going to be games for another five months or so. We'll have to find ways to occupy our time until then. And then we have practice highlights and post-practice interviews and press conferences, all kinds of videos, things for you to consume on the video side at youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. So subscribe to our YouTube channel, and you won't miss any of it. Of course, you can turn on notifications and uh, get an alert sent to your phone. I told you about it last time. I'm going to tell you about it again today. Snapper49.com. Our guy Byron Floyd, Pitt's long snapper, did a great job stepping in for Cal Adamitis in his first year as a starter last year. And he's raising money for Children's Hospital. Um, it's a great uh, charity. It's a great... Uh, um, you know, a great charity effort by Byron Floyd. Go look at snapper49.com. It's his number, 49. He is the snapper. Makes sense, snapper49.com. You can get a sweet shirt like this, or I think he's got hats. He's got seasonings, seasoning blends, which uh, are really tasty and very versatile. You can do a lot of different things with them. Go check it out, snapper49.com. It's for a good cause. He's ra- He's using NIL. It's kind of that other side of NIL. It's not just guys getting cars and things like that. It's that other side of NIL where he's using his his position of prominence as a pit football player to raise money to help, uh, you know, help charity and and help a really good cause that's important to him personally. And I think it's probably important to all of us. We've probably all been touched one way or another by uh, the efforts of Children's Hospital, and they could certainly use everyone's support. So snapper49.com, go help Byron reach his goal. Byron, Ford is, Byron Floyd is on special teams, of course, and we talked about the kickers yesterday, but I've been really thinking about Pitt's defense this week, I mean, throughout the offseason, but this week in particular. I just, I've just i been thinking about the defense quite a bit. Um, some of the positions where they're replacing starters, some of the positions where they have guys coming back, and some of the positions where they just need a bigger contribution than maybe they've gotten in the past. And one of the things that's really remarkable to me as we enter, uh, you know, really about to wrap up the penultimate week of spring camp 2023, is this is a defense replacing some really significant starters. I mean, you're talking about Haba Baldonado and Deslin Alexander. You're talking about Kalijah Kansi, you're replacing unanimous All American, potential first round draft pick. You're replacing Servazier Dennis, your all conference, do everything middle linebacker. You're replacing both safeties. I mean, you've been gutted in this defense right up the middle, front to back. You know, I remember at um, uh, Media Day last year talking to, I forget if it was Brandon Hill or Servazier Dennis or Kalijah Kansi. I ultimately talked to all three of them about this, about how they formed this sort of 7 8 9. Um, it's not a triangle because it's a straight line right up the middle of the defense of the defensive tackle, Kalaja Kansi being number eight, uh, Servasier Dennis, the middle linebacker being number seven and Brandon Hill, the boundary safety who plays down in the box being number nine. And, and just these three guys just sort of right up the middle, the strength of the defense right in the heart of it. Um, and, and really being a, a, a huge, I mean, pretty much led the charge for the defense last year. I was just going to bring up their stats real quick. But, I mean, in those three guys, Servasier Dennis and and Kalijah Kansi and Brandon Hill, you've got the team's top two leading tacklers. Servasier Dennis had 94 tackles. Brandon Hill had 67. Um, you've got the team leader in sacks in Kalijah Kansi and, and tackles for loss. He had 14 and a half tackles for loss, seven and a half sacks. Um, Dennis was right behind him. He had 12 tackles for loss and seven sacks. Brandon Hill, like I said, had 67 tackles. He had one fumble recovery for, for 30 yards. He broke up a couple passes. Uh, you know, that's just those three guys. You throw in Eric Halliday at three interceptions last year, eight over the course of the last three seasons. 
Um, he had three tackles for loss. Habba Baldonado had five tackles for loss and two sacks. He was limited, you know, with, with injuries. Um, Desmond Alexandra, six and a half tackles for loss, five and a half sacks. You know, really, uh, John Morgan, even, you could throw him in. Five and a half tackles for loss, two and a half sacks. Losing so much from this defense. I mean, th those guys I just listed, Baldonado, Alexander, Cansey, Dennis, Hill, Hallett, that's six starters. And John Morgan started a bunch of games, too, either in place of, of Baldonado or, or Alexander or wherever. I mean, but you essentially have six open starting spots heading into this 2023 season. That's a lot to replace. You know, I mean, you're, you're replacing more than half the starters. And and really, I mean, you know, it, it's been a while since Pitt has had that much to replace at one time. But what's remarkable to me, what's really interesting to me, and I think it's telling on, on a number of levels, is I don't sense a lot of concern. I don't sense a lot of panic uh, among pit fans, I don't sense a lot of panic among pit coaches. I don't sense a lot of panic among pit players. Uh, I, there's this, and and I mean, players and coaches are never going to panic about something like this in spring camp. About oh my god, how are we going to replace all these guys? But fans will, except they don't seem to be. And there seems to be just this general sense of sort of calmness and blind faith that it'll be fine. No problem. You got to replace your, you know, three of your most productive players. You know, six, ultimately six guys who put up a whole lot of your defensive production right up the middle of the defense and, and three out of your four starters on the defensive line. Doesn't seem to be really getting anyone to really bat an, bat an eye at it or raise an eyebrow. There's a whole lot of, as I said, blind faith in... Pitt being able to just slide guys in and keep it rolling with a defense that's been one of the best in, in the ACC and in some stat categories, one of the best in the country over the last few years. And it's remarkable to see that because fans are prone to panic at just about anything. Certainly Pitt fans, although I don't think Pitt fans are unique in their predilection toward you know uh, panicking. Uh, but most fans would panic over something like this. But And I think there are a few reasons for this. Fans don't really seem to be panicking. And there is sort of a quiet and sometimes not so quiet confidence from the players and coaches about what they're going to be able to do on defense this year, even though they're replacing all of those guys. And it brings me back to a cliche that is, is often used um, mostly in sports, maybe exclusively in sports, that you know there's, there's a difference between rebuilding and reloading. And the teams that have, you know, when we're talking about college sports, uh, and even you could apply this in, in different terms to pro sports, the teams that have recruited well, that have evaluated well, that have developed well in pro, sp in pro sports, they've drafted well as opposed to recruited. But the, the teams that have evaluated well and developed well reload. They don't rebuild. There's no real starting over. There's an expectation of carrying over. There's an expectation that, the new guys will be able to do what the old guys did and do it just as well, if not better. And I think that sense is definitely present with Pitt's defense at this point, at this stage in the game, after whatever, eight years of Pat Narduzzi heading into number nine. I think there's definitely a feeling that on defense, they're going to reload rather than rebuild. And to be honest, I don't think that, uh, that, that assumption or presumption is uh, you know off base or, or or based on on anything weak? I think there's a precedent for it. Actually, I was thinking about the safeties, right? You know, if you think about 2019 into 2020, it's a big deal because Paris Ford is coming back and Demar Hamlin is coming back, and and say what you will about Paris Ford and and his consistency and reliability on the field, and ultimately the way his career ended at Pitt and what has happened since then. And we talked about a lot of those things at the time, about what Paris Ford needed to do better in 2020 to make himself into the high draft pick that he, he thought he should be and that you know a lot of us believed he could be. And we, we talked about those parts of his game, but there's no denying that I mean Ford and Hamlin together were a pretty strong duo at safety. And so, you know, 2020, obviously Ford leaves the team midseason. Uh, by the end of the but I mean either way, by the end of the year, 
you know, DeMar Hamlin and Paris Ford weren't going to be the safeties. They weren't going to be on the roster in 2021. I mean, everybody knew that at the start of 2020, Hamlin would be out of eligibility and Ford would be off to the NFL. And so there was always going to be this transition, both replacing both safeties. Now they ended up replacing those safeties earlier, earlier than they expected with Ford's departure and some injuries to Hamlin. Eric Hallett and Brandon Hill both got a lot, of, a decent amount of playing time in the second half of the 2020 season. But you go from Hamlin and Ford, who had built up a reputation as a very good safety duo, and when you transition to Hallett and Hill, you don't rebuild at safety, you reload. Because in 2021, the first year with those two guys as the main starting safeties, just brought it up. Brandon Hill was the second leading tackler on the team. He had 81 tackles and made two interceptions. Eric Hallett was fourth leading tackler on the team. He had three interceptions, including two in the ACC championship game and was the MVP of the, the, the uh, ACC title game. They didn't rebuild at safety from one year to the next. They reloaded from Hamlin and Ford to Hallett and Hill. And they've done this consistently. I mean, coming out of last year, even you could you could look at last year where they went from I mean they had all these veteran linebackers right I mean you had uh you know you know, you, you, you Phil Campbell and uh, um and and Cam Bright kind of big pieces of that ACC title team in 2021 they're all gone Chase Pine is gone and heading into 2022 John Patrician was gone 2022 they're going to need a bunch of new guys to step up and so they get some transfers and Shane Simon and Tyler Wiltz uh Bengali Kamara steps into a starting role Solomon DeShield steps up into a primary rotational role and a role in the defensive sub package and while there was some slow going early on the transition did have its bumps by the end of the year I mean that unit was playing as well as the one that preceded it you know they, they were playing really really well that the, the linebackers were were good were a strength of the defense one of many because they reloaded. They didn't rebuild. And even if they, they went out and got some guys from the transfer portal, it, it sort of it still followed that general path. You look at the defensive line, how they've done it sort of year after year after year. I mean, this team ends up at, you know top five in sacks for the last three seasons, I think it was. Or was it top three in sacks for the last five seasons? I, I saw the tweet yesterday. But they've been one of the best teams in the country at sacking the quarterback. There's a lot of factors that go into that. But you can boil it down to the defensive line has been really good. And a huge amount of credit for that goes to Charlie Partridge. But not just that he waves a wand and guys are really good at sacking the quarterback. It's because he evaluates well, he recruits well, and he develops well. And so when they have guys leave, when they have to replace players, when Jalen Twyman's gone, they get Kalaji Kansi to step in. You know, when they have to transition Pat from Rashad Weaver and Patrick Jones, they end up with Habba Baldonado and Deslin Alexandra leading the charge. They reload. They don't just rebuild. They reload. And and that's been the case, that is, I think, at all three levels of the defense. Dane Jackson, Damari Mathis, Jason Pinnock. How are you going to replace those guys? Well, you got Marquez Williams and A.J. Woods and MJ, MJ Devonshire. And they seem to be playing really well. You know, And they've played really well since Jackson and then Pinnock and then Mathis have sort of cycled out. And when these guys cycle on, when Williams leaves and Woods leaves and Devonshire leaves, and I think Williams and Woods are out of eligibility after this season, Devonshire can go if he wants. I, you know, I think he's he's eligible to go. He's been in college long enough. I think he might still have one year of eligibility after this, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. He could potentially come back for 2024. But when those guys do trend, you know, move on to the next, next level or wherever the next stage of, of their careers is, they're probably going to be set to reload with some of these younger corners that they've recruited. Ryland Gandy and Noah Bigelow and Rashad Battle and some of the guys in this class who are coming in. They're just reloading. They're not rebuilding. And so when you look at this season, when they've got these six open spots and you're trying to figure out what are they going to do? How are they going to, how are they going to fill this? How are they going to fill that? Well, at safety, they're going to go with Javon McIntyre who actually played a decent amount over the last few games of last season and, and made some big splash plays. He wasn't perfect in his details and his, his assignments, but he made some big plays. And then, you know, at the other safety spot, it might be P.J. O'Brien, who's seen the field a decent amount. It might be Steph Hall, who's impressed a lot uh, in, in spring camp so far. 
But either way, they're they're both really good athletes who fit this defense well, and they've been learning it for a few years, and they're going to be ready to step in. At linebacker, how are you going to replace Savasia Dennis? Where you're going to take Shane Simon, who played a lot, I mean, who was a starter last season at the money linebacker position. He's going to, and he also got snaps and, and starts, I think, at the middle linebacker spot when Dennis was hurt. And you're going to move Simon into the middle of the defense. You're going to keep Bengali Kamara, who, you know, should have a lot of those growing pains out of his system from last season. He's going to be starting at the star linebacker. You're going to have Simon in the middle. And then Solomon DeShields, who got all those reps last year as a, on the defensive sub package and as a rotational money linebacker or outside linebacker, he's going to step into a starting job. They're going to reload there. They're not rebuilding linebacker this year. They're reloading. And up front, it's going to be a little more of a challenge because you have three out of four starters leaving, including a unanimous All-American defensive tackle who led your team in sacks and is probably going to be a first-round draft pick. That's a lot to replace. There's a, there's a lot of, you're going to have some work to do there. But here again, I, I think there are two position groups that you look at on this roster where by this point we should pretty much have almost unwavering confidence in the coaching staff, in their ability to recruit, evaluate, and develop. And those two positions are the defensive backs and the defensive line. Because Charlie Partridge has done enough, I think, to earn that kind of, uh, again, almost sort of blind faith. You know, So, yeah, he's going to be relying on younger guys this year. Dayon Hayes is, is going to be the elder statesman of the group. Bam Brema is an older guy, but he hasn't played as much. And there's going to be guys like Nikai Johnson or Sam Okunlola or Jimmy Scott. You know, a couple of second-year players there. These guys are going to be getting meaningful time. But by all accounts, they're having great spring camps. All those young defensive ends are making plays and making an impact. And they're doing it against an older, veteran, more experienced offensive line, which I don't think is as big of a knock on the offense. I, I'm choosing not to take it as being a huge knock on the offensive line. I'm take, choosing to take it as a big plus for the defensive line and for those young defensive ends that they are really seizing the opportunity that's been presented to them by all those guys leaving, Baldonado and Morgan and Alexandra. Now they'll need another defensive tackle to step up. They've got the three old guys back, Devin Danielson and David Green and Tyler Bentley. But they're going to need a Sean Fitzsimmons or an Elliot Donald or DeAndre Jules, who's older, but you know, kind of like Bam Brema doesn't have a ton of experience there. They're going to need what, or even Isaiah Neal, the, the true freshman who enrolled in January and has been opening eyes and making plays. They're going to need somebody else to step up there, ideally someone who can make you know, put up numbers and get in the backfield and, and get production, which Daniels and Bentley and Green haven't really done that much of. Whereas Cansey was making those plays and Jalen Twyman was making those plays. They're, they're looking for another guy to step into that spot. But even on the defensive line where they're replacing the most and they have the most open starting jobs and the least amount of experience available to take over those starting spots, even there, it's it, it feels like a reload more than a rebuild. And that's a credit to the recruiting that this staff has done. And, and I think that is part of why there's there's kind of quiet or calm optimism about this defense. Because if there's one side of the ball that this staff has recruited better over the past eight years, it's defense. I think, I think we can all agree about that. They would probably agree, agree about that. And there's probably a lot of reasons behind that. This has been a team that has excelled on defense far more consistently than it has excelled on offense. They've had good offensive teams, like two of them, over the course of eight years. And so that's not, and they were separated by, what, five seasons? That's not exactly uh, consistent success on offense. But they have been consistently good on defense basically since 2017. So 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. For the last six seasons, they have been consistently good on defense. They've played winning defense. They've played championship defense. Even if their offense didn't hold up its end of the bargain and ultimately win some of those championships and maybe they would have had an opportunity to win, they could have just scored a few more points. But I digress. This team has consistently had a very good defense for the last six years. And I, I think, I, I'm not going to say that it recruits itself because the coaches have to work very hard on the recruiting front to land all of these guys. But it's a very appealing defense to play in. And so they've recruited well on that side of the ball. 
we've seen that. I, I think we've all been impressed by their defensive recruiting, e even in years where maybe the recruiting class as a whole didn't look great. I think you'd still point to defensive players and say, boy, that guy looks good. I mean, look at last year's class with Jordan or the class coming in now as freshmen with Jordan Bass and uh, Isaiah Neal, like I mentioned, who's already here, or Shadarian Harrison or Jesse Anderson. I mean, there's some really good defensive players in this class coming in, you know, again, that's the trend year after year after year. They're recruiting really well on defense. And then we've got plenty of evidence of them coaching guys up and developing them so that when their time comes, they're ready to step in and just carry on the success. They're ready to reload, not rebuild. And that's the story with Pitt's defense. They're reloading. They're not rebuilding. It's, it's how it looks, at least to me. It doesn't look like a team, a defense that's rebuilding. It looks like one that absolutely intends to keep up and sustain the success it has had over the last, what did I say, six years, seven years, something like that, six years. Because I don't think we would say 2016 was a very successful defense. But since then, they've been very, very good. Not without their blemishes, not without their games like the 2017 Oklahoma State game. Um, you know, they've had games where they've gotten beat up by really good offenses. But on the whole, they've been pretty, pretty good on defense pretty much since 2016. You know, starting in the 17th season, they've been uh, a dominant unit. One of the best defenses in the ACC, if not, well, I wouldn't say the best, but they're up there. You know, there, there aren't many teams ahead of them. We'll say it that way. Um, make sure you go check out snapper49.com. I'm going to shout them out again because Byron's a man uh, you know, doing great stuff. Trying to raise money for Children's Hospital. It's a cause I think we can all get behind. So go to snapper49.com. I'm I'm shouting that out before I even mention pantherlair.com, which is the most comprehensive source of Pitt Sports news on the internet. Panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. Go there for all your coverage of Pitt football, basketball, recruiting, and everything else going on in the world of Pitt sports. And then, of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. Like this video. Where is it? It's right down there, I think, somewhere around there. There's a thumbs up. It's it's YouTube's website. I mean, just click the thumbs up uh, or on your phone, hit the little thumbs up button and like this video. We appreciate it. Thanks for checking in today. Got a fun uh, mailbag edition of the Morning Pit planned for tomorrow. So if you're on pantheralert.com, you want to get a question in for tomorrow's mailbag edition of the Morning Pit, go. Uh, there's a thread on the Between Fifth and Forbes message board. Go there and uh, put your question in the thread and we will uh we'll answer as many as we can on the morning pit tomorrow thanks so much for tuning in today we appreciate you watching i hope you've had a great week so far thursday it's almost to the end of the week so i hope you have a great thursday and we will talk to you tomorrow morning for the morning pit right here on youtube.com slash